Well, thank you very much for being here today, Don. I know we've had a lot of winding up, getting everything ready, so I know you're a busy guy. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to sit and talk with you about the history of your people. That really means a lot to me. Um, storytelling is why I do what I do. And uh, this is, I think, going to be a really neat story to tell to a lot of people. So why don't we begin by you telling me a little bit about yourself and your history. So uh, what was it like uh, growing up in the Tonkawa tribe and um, having that history with your family? Well, <clears throat> you asked that question and, and uh, I immediately thought of a, a story in uh, on a TV show, uh, MASH, you've probably oh, seen Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Alan Alda, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, he was asked that same question, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, to start off with, he said, I was born in a log hospital. A log uh, hospital. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, the, the history is there. All yeah. those cool. famous people back in the day were born sure. in log cabins. Yeah, yeah. Know? One of my yeah. mentors was born yeah. in a one-room cabin with a dirt floor. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know that was that was kind of my upbringing. You yeah. know, I I had uh, three sisters, four four of us all together, my mom and dad, and and we basically lived in a log cabin. You know, wow. it wasn't yeah. such, but it was a one room house. You yeah, know? six of us lived in a one room house. Wow. Yeah, and you know that one room contained everything. You know, sure, yeah. bedroom, dining room, the whole works. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, a kid went home with me from school one day, you know, little, <laughs> little, little white kid, little non-Indian kid, and we walked in the house, and he stood there looking around, and he said, "Don, where, where's your room? Said, <laughs> you're, hey, in <laughs> you're in it. You're in it." Yeah, everybody, everybody lived in that one room, you know. Yeah. Uh, my mom and dad had a bed with two mattresses on it, yeah. and every night they'd take the top mattress off and put it on the floor. And my sisters would sleep in the mattress on the floor, yeah. mom and dad on the bed. And then I had a, uh, my dad was in the Navy and he had an old Navy a bedroll. Oh, yeah. You know? And that was my bed, you know. And so oh, cool. every every night I'd roll out that old Navy bedroll and sleep at the foot of the, you know, the whole floor of the little one room house was covered when we were sleeping at night, you know. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the way it was. We were very poor people, yeah. you know. Uh, the entire tribe was poor people at that time. Every Indian tribe was a, a poor entity at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the living conditions of some of the other tribes was even worse, you know. But uh, that's how we lived, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, my early growing up years, you know. And, and uh, uh, finally, you know, at uh, the fourth, fifth grade or somewhere like that, my, my mom asked me if, I would be interested in going to the Indian school, government boarding school, mm. which was located at the town of Pawnee, about 50 miles from here, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all were aware and knew about that Indian school, you know. Everybody had known. People had went older. People had been there, you know. And my mom asked me, she said, would, would, would you kids like to go to Indian school? And I wasn't sure. I said, what's it like? Yeah. She said, well, you got your own bed. <laughs> and three meals a day. Yeah. I said, I'll take it. Right. I'll take it. Where do I sign? I'll take it. That yeah. was that was luxury living. Yeah. And I went to the Indian school, a boarding school, and basically was there for, you know, until I graduated from the eighth grade, you know, like that. And from there, I went to another Indian school at Shalaco up here in the ninth grade. You okay. Know? And uh, I think that I heard that you were in a mechanics program out there. Yeah, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, and yeah. then you ended up enlisting in the Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. At the Indian school at Shalako, it, it was a combination of, uh, of, of uh, academic school and uh, trade school, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and the process was you had to go to class, academic classes, a half a day and the other half a day in a, in a trade of your choice. Mm -hmm. And Shilako had many trades, you know, auto mechanics, you know, plumbing, painting, carpentry, you know, yeah. uh, welding, you know, like that, you know. Boy, we sure need those trades today. Yeah. It's getting and harder it's to find It's kind of like those, uh, yeah. what we know as the Votex today, mm -hmm. you see, but it was a trade school. And so I chose auto mechanics, you know. Yep. And then we also were required as pre freshmen to uh, take a, a course in agriculture. Oh, cool. 
because Shilako was pretty much a self-sustaining school. It had a large agricultural uh, farm, you know, mm -hmm. dairy cattle, hogs, sheep, turkeys, chickens, you know, which supplied the dining hall at the school, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I worked in the in a agriculture area, you know, as well. So know? it provides the training for everybody, and then yeah, I'm sure yeah, they sell yeah. the product that oh, they yeah, produce yeah, there, yeah. and it feeds the school. Well, yeah. it was mostly to, to, to supply the dining hall, you know. Oh, okay. We'd, we'd butcher butcher beef, sheep, uh, hogs, oh. you know, turkeys, and chickens. You're making on, me hungry. On a weekly basis, <laughs> yeah. you know, to supply the, and of course a dairy had probably 100, 120 dairy cattle, which provided a milk, ice cream yeah. and other dairy products for the mm -hmm. school, you know. So that's quite an experience, you know. And then we had a, a, a horse barn, you know, where where we had uh, thoroughbred Morgan horses, you know, which Ooh, we yeah. had an opportunity to, to groom and to raise and to even show in the local fairs, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty good experience, yeah. Okay, know? interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been reading a little bit about the history of the Tonkawa tribe. And uh, one of the stories that I was reading is, was it your, the founder of the tribe, there was a legend that he was raised by wolves or coyotes. Is that correct? Well, not exactly, but you're, yeah, so you're, tell me the, you're the on story track. from yeah, here. Yeah. You know, uh, you know every, every people, yeah. you know, every people all across the world, you know, every, every unique, unique society of people all across the world have stories about their origins, sure, yeah. you know. And the Tonkawa are no different. Mm -hmm. you know? The Tonkawa believe that they came into being in an area in what is now known as Texas, mm -hmm. South Texas, you mm -hmm. know, like that. And there's a there's a mountain down there that they refer to as in Spanish El Tortuga, means the oh, turtle, yeah. you know. And the Tonkawa, the Tonkawa legendary history recalls that the Tonkawa were born, you know, or came out of the earth at the foot of that particular mountain. You know, mm. and uh, the wolf, uh, the prairie wolf, was a medium that brought the first Tonkawa out of uh, out of the earth. I see. Yeah, and there's there's a kind of a story, uh, uh, how that goes, you know, and and then the Tonkawa incorporated a dance, which they used to perform on an annual basis, which which basically enacted that story mm -hmm. about how God, the Creator, you know, established the first human, you know. And it came out of the earth, and the wolf was a medium that uncovered him and brought him out of the earth. What was the name of the creator, La? His name? Kokonkwala. Oh. That's God. Kokonkwala? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Christ is, in our Tonkawa language, is Techas. Hmm. And I, I, I used to use that word as a kind of a play on words with. Texans, you know. Right, yeah. When I when I go down to Texas, you know, sometimes I go visit schools yeah. and talk and everything. And, you know, Texans are kind of arrogant people anyway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk to Texans and and uh, I heard a Texan say, yeah, Texas is God's country. You yeah, might have heard right, that expression. Yeah, yeah. People say that wherever. Oklahoma say that too. Yeah. And I tell them, say, well, you're right. You know, I said, that's, that's how it got its name because... In our language, we refer to Christ as Texas. <laughs> and if you spell that or write that phonetically, yeah. it's T-E-X-A-S, yeah. Texas. Yeah. Is like that really it. how Texas got its name, though? It, uh, who knows? Yeah. Could very well be. Right. Yeah, you, you know. never know. But they like that story. Yeah, sure. No, yeah, that's a good like one. That I like story. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. uh, since the origins of your tribe, what are some of the key moments in, in the history that has made you into the people that you are today? Well, you know, it, it, it's hard to really identify a, a particular moment, yeah. you know. Um, I think our our best time was when we lived in Texas, you know. Yeah. When we when we lived free, you know, uh, lived uh, the life that uh, that we believe the Creator uh, intended for us to live, you mm -hmm. know. And until the encroachment of the non-Indian, the European, yeah. you know, and began to encroach upon our land, moved us off, eventually moved us into the confined area of a reservation, you know, yeah. and and uh, things uh, things deteriorated from that time on. Yeah. So you know, when we lived in Texas, you know, we we're we we're free people. You know, we we lived our language, our culture was was totally intact. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Know? And and we were um, we were, we were um, the history book says 
Tonkawa tribe was one of the most warlike tribes in the southern plains. Mm-hmm. So we were a, uh, a warlike people, you know, mm-hmm. which which meant, you know, that we were very, very quick to defend ourselves and who we were, our land, our people, yeah. you know, our children, you know, our culture, you know, against any who would, you know, encroach imp- encroach upon that, you know. Yeah. So we were always fighting the battle, you know, to preserve ourselves. Yeah. And that was probably our greatest moments in time. Once we moved on to the reservation, we become kind of uh, subject to, you know, control of the federal government, you yeah. know, and, and the federal government's paternalistic attitude over us, you know, kind of mm-hmm. subjected us to uh, the d- dependence on the federal government from that time on. And, and uh, a dependent nation is basically a broken nation, yeah. if you can understand that. You yeah. Know? So that was not a good time, you know. Right. But we've recovered, you know, uh, we're living in these modern times. Uh, our tribes are, uh, are are successful, thriving, you know, our, our numbers have increased. Oh, that's you know, good. Uh, 800%, you know, wow. in the last 40 or 50 years, you know. So, you know, uh, now is a good moment in time as well. Yeah. So what was, you said, in the last 50 years, so at the beginning of that period, what was the number of your tribe and what, where is our, when it now? When our tribe was moved onto the reservation the first time in 1859, mm-hmm. I think it was, you know, uh, around in there, we were given a reservation in southern Oklahoma, mm-hmm. right on a reservation in the midst of all of our former enemies, yeah. you know. <laughs> wow, yeah. And uh, you can imagine, you know, the, the outcome. That's like throwing a cat into a dog pound right yeah you know, yeah and all of those tribes that were former enemies on that reservation uh, rebelled one time attacked the agency you know and took opportunity to attack their old enemy which was mm-hmm. the Tonkawa tribe and i was reading about that it was and, called the Tonkawa massacre right yeah and yeah. those other seven tribes you know outnumbered our people sure you know and of course at the time and they timed it well all of our men were away from the village out on a hunt down near the Red River. And so they attacked our village, which basically contained nothing but women and children and old people, yeah. you know, and slaughtered a great number, you know. Man. And our tribe numbered probably about anywhere from 250 to 300 at that time, mm-hmm. you know. And afterwards, uh, you know, about half of about half of that tribe was massacred yeah. at that time. You know? And I was reading, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but... Some of them were captured and eaten by their enemies. Was that right? Uh, well, by other tribes. I, that's what the history books say. Okay, who yeah. can verify? Sure, that? sure. Yeah, you know, no, yeah. man. I was just yeah. like that. Yeah. Is that is you know, vicious? Holy you know, cow! History, history is an important subject, you know, and and it's uh, always always subject for debate. Right. Debate, you know, history history is simply about not necessarily what happened, but what got reported. Yes. You know. And so uh, whoever reported that, you know, must have had a, a some weird imagination. Yeah. I remember uh, reading once someone saying that, uh, you know, history is malleable. And someone said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, how else would we keep historians busy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's open to interpretation, yeah, it seems yeah, like, with each yeah, generation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you also served in the Air Force, correct? Yeah, I was in the Air Force six years, yeah. And you were telling me that you served on a refueling unit. And yeah, I was in an re- air refueling unit, and I was also in a, in a, what we call air sea survival unit, which was my job, you know, yeah. So can you describe what you were doing in the refueling unit? You were well, the, refueling. Well, yeah, pl- yeah, it was maintaining, maintaining a, a, a in-flight refueling aircraft. You know? Yeah. You might have seen pictures of the of uh, the the aircraft at the time was called a KC-135, mm-hmm. big big fuel tanker, and they would refuel bombers, B-52s in flight. You've seen those. That is so great. Yeah. The precision required yeah, to pull yeah, that off you know, is incredible. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, so my job was to provide uh, 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 air rescue equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, parachutes, life rafts, you know, and and all that went into uh, survival equipment necessary for overseas flights, you know, in the case a plane went down in the sea or something like that, you know. So, yeah. When was your period of service in the Air I Force? I was in uh, 50, 1957 to 1963. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So talking about MASH, I mean, you're familiar with that area, yeah, era right, of military right. service. Yeah, That's yeah, cool. Yeah. So um, talking about what the Tonkawa tribe is doing now, you're preserving your language, correct? Well, By doing we're language doing classes? our best. Yeah. We're doing our best, you know. <clears throat> there was a time in uh, the history of Native America in, in this country whereby, you know, the the object of the federal government was basically to assimilate all Native America into the American mainstream. Mm. You know, uh, someone once said that the only, well, Andrew Jackson, a famous quote, said the only good Indian is a dead Indian. You mm. know? But another man once said uh, the only good Indian is a civilized Indian, whatever civilization means. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> there was an army, an army uh, officer by the name of, I believe his name was Richard Pratt, you know, who uh, who was um, uh, involved in the, the capture and imprisonment of Geronimo and the Apache Apache captives of that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And they'd sent them all the way to a prison down in Florida, hmm. you know, from their home country in Arizona all the way down there. And, and this Pratt had a notion that that they'd probably have trouble with Indian tribes forever if they didn't civilize them, you know. Mm. And so he was instrumental in, in, in getting, helping establish the first Indian school in, in Pennsylvania, and it was called Carlisle. You might have heard of Carlisle Indian School, Pennsylvania, mm. where Jim Thorpe, the famous athlete, mm. went to school yeah. and excelled in sports, you know. Yeah. And his motto at that time was, kill the Indian, save the man. Mm. I have Follow heard that, that expression, logic. yeah. In other words, strip him of his tribal identity, you know, uh, his language, a notion of his culture, and assimilate him in American mainstream. Mm -hmm. And that was a process that was ongoing for a long time. Mm. And many, many tribes, you know, uh, individuals succumbed to that pressure. You know, uh, the Indian schools, you know, uh, uh, were very adamant about teaching you English, you know, and, reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, and, and tried to uh, basically strip uh, all of the uh, traditional cultures from your mindset, mm -hmm. you know, and civilize you in the ways of the white man. And it, they succeeded to a great degree. And as a result of that pressure, a lot of tribal languages were, were lost mm. because uh, the individuals were not speaking their language anymore. Right. And parents generation of parent and grandparent before me were subject to that kind of pressure, you know, and they therefore they did not teach their children the language, you know. I heard an old man one time in one of our neighboring tribes, he's long since passed away, but he's well over a hundred, and he said, uh, he said, me and my wife talked when we begin to have children, and he said, we're not going to, we're not going to teach them our language. We want them to learn English and learn the ways of the white man because that's the only way they're going to survive in the future. Mm. So you can see, you know, the evidence of that pressure having yeah. an effect on that generation. You sure. Know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, now that's all changed. You know, now there's a national thrust, you know, to revive tribal languages. Mm -hmm. uh, federal program monies are being made available to revitalize tribal languages and stuff. And, and many tribes are taking advantage of that, you know. So uh, we agree with it. And so we're trying to do our very best to... To, to revitalize our language, you know. Mm -hmm. I heard a man from a tribe down south, he said, when you lose your language, you lose your identity. Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, so you said that there are certain traditions, like the dance that your tribe used to do on an annual basis to reenact the origins of your tribe. Um, is that still something that happens, and when does that happen? Periodically, but not often, yeah. And we do that sometimes for a... For a uh, dramatic show purpose. Sure. You yeah. know, and it's a, uh, it's just a reenactment of that, of that legendary story. Sure. Know? Yeah. 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 Are there any other, um, things like that, that are a unique part of your culture well, that you, yeah. that you, you know, we practice have a, together? We have a powwow every year. See these photos all around here? Uh -huh. These are photos from our various, uh, powwow dance activities. You oh, know? okay, cool. And so we have a number of our dances that are kept alive, you know, and, and are continued to be practiced on a on a regular basis, you know. 
Okay. So that that aspect of our culture has been pretty much maintained even down through the the years where pressures were applied to basically, you know, uh, stop doing this sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Many tribes had a lot of dances, you know, that were associated with warfare and some of the other spiritual activities that were actually abolished uh, by law mm. by the federal government, you know. So there was there was a, a great pressure to to eliminate, you know, the the important aspects was of culture. Knowledge of them lost completely, or has a lot of them, a okay. lot of them, yeah. Mm. For example, our tribe and every tribe in America had had uh, in our in our traditional times, you know, in our history, we had a lot of ceremonial activities, customs, and traditions that were carried on on a regular basis. You know, a lot of them have since been forgotten. You know. Mm. Yeah. And we're down to just a few. Yeah. Yeah. So we're sitting in front of the symbol of your tribe. Um, do you know what each of these elements mean? Can you well, break yeah. it down, the yeah. story for me? Yeah. You see, if you look at the background, you see a kind of a profile of the earth with a, mm -hmm. with a little mountain. Is that, that the mountain mountains. you were talking about? That's a mountain. El, okay. El Tortuga, you see, you know. And then that bird, what we call a uh, water bird or spirit bird, represents, you know, the spirit of our people, you know, rising out of the I earth see. at okay. the foot of that mountain, mm -hmm. you know. And then, of course, that pipe, that pipe is, uh, uh, in, in our legend says it was a gift from God, you know, that, uh, that uh, uh, through, through the use of that pipe and the tobacco and, and the prayers that, that are associated with that, was our connectedness from mortality to the spirit world mm. or the God himself yeah. who created us. Yeah. There is something about smoking a pipe and the act yeah. of, of smoking yeah. and seeing the smoke diffuse into the atmosphere mm. that has a yeah. spiritual component yeah. to it. Yeah. And then that crescent, you see that crescent uh, above that, you know, that, that's a symbol of the altar place and our sacred ceremonial uh, uh, religious activity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The crescent above the bird. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. and and then the rays of that sun. Yeah. That 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 image behind is the sun, and then the rays of that sun represents a, a new dawning. Uh, oh, okay. Re, re revival of our tribe. A girl in our tribe by the name of uh, Jeannie Norman uh, done that bird and the and the uh, the crescent, just a bird in the crescent, originally, you know, and that's all there was to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got and, it. And, and so one day I told him, I said, well, you know, that, that, that's, that's not a seal. And generally the seals of sovereign nations are, you know, a seal, you stamp yeah, them. Right. They're round, you know, yeah. seal of the United States, you know, seal of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So I said, we need to make it look like a seal before it was just that bird and that crescent. I see. On a, on a banner, you know, you know, and it was just a, just an emblem more than a seal, you know. So you were talking about the rays of the sun being symbolic of a new dawn, a new beginning. Um, what is your hope and your vision for your tribe in the future? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know, from 1938, we established a, a constitutional government. You mm -hmm. know, at that time, there were like less than 50 Tonka was still alive. Mm. You know, wow. yeah, yeah, you know, and we began to grow from there and established uh, what I call a constitutional government, which which meant that we begin to function like, uh, on the federalist model, you know, a right. democracy mm -hmm. with a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, general counsel, and so on, just like the government of the United States or right. or the government of of the state. Okay, right. prior to that time. Our tribe was ruled by chiefs, yes. and so the chieftainum uh, died out. Our last chief, our last chief from the old order of chiefs, died in 1929. Mm. So you can see from 1929 until 1938, mm -hmm. about a nine-year period. You know, our tribe basically uh, did not, did not, uh, did not uh, uh, self-rule like a sovereignty should. We're basically under the authority of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, mm. you know, and so that constitution was established then, and we begin a new 
dawning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see, yeah. thus the the sun mm-hmm. thing like that. You know, and and we begin to establish ourselves under a, uh, a constitutional democratic government, like all entities in in the, in the democracy of America. Mm-hmm. You know, like that. And so that was the beginning. You know, yeah. Her her grandfather was a president beginning in I think nineteen. 63 or, or somewhere mm-hmm. in that time, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 50 years from now, where would you like to see your tribe? Well, <laughs> still here, yeah. for one thing, yeah. yeah. Right. And grown beyond its current yeah. size or I any heard particular a, heard traditions? Guy, I heard a guy once say, somebody, somebody introduced an elderly man, he said, uh, Mr. S- Mr. Smith, whatever he said, uh, I'm really glad to see you. It's, it's nice to be here. And he said, at my age, it's nice to be anywhere. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so One of my mentors is in his 80s, and yeah. he's always like, it's always better to be seen than viewed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I was kind of facetious, you know. We're, yeah. I hope we're still here. Yeah, you know? sure. And I'm sure we will be because we've grown, you know. Uh, when we first come to the reservation in, in uh, 1885, you know, our tribe numbered, you know, right around a hundred. We number somewhere around eight hundred to nine hundred right now. Oh, that's awesome. So we've grown, you know, eight or nine hundred percent in sure. in that last hundred and thirty, forty years or so, you know. So I see us continue to grow, you know, maybe not at that same rate, you know, but you know, population of the world's continuing to yeah. increase. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so we're right along with that, you know. But We've been very progressive, you know, in terms of economic development. You have a couple of casinos, you know, which are very profitable. You know, we have some other endeavors that are ongoing, you know. So uh, we're taking advantage of opportunity that we have today and continue to grow and prosper. And I, I hope we can continue to do that into the future. I see a lot of wheat and corn fields around here. Do you all also have agricultural things going on in the background? Well, you know, we have a considerable amount of land, you know, probably, oh, 1,500, 1,800 acres, you know, uh, and and most of it we have leased out to local farmers. Oh, okay. Who, who, who farm it, wheat, corn, and so on, you know. And then we have some property up there of our own where we have cattle, you know, and some agriculture of our own, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is there anything that you would, if you're speaking to future members of your tribe, new generations of your tribe, uh, what advice would you give to them? What would you say to them? Well, if I could, if I could have my say, I, I, would, I would ask them to, to take more pride in self, you know, endeavor to, to reestablish yourself in the cultural ways of our traditions, you know. How could they do that? Through these programs that we have, like the revitalization of our language, learn mm-hmm. a language. Mm-hmm. I, I, again, I mentioned, I said, a man once said, when you lose your language, you, you lose your identity. Yeah. I heard a, a man, uh, a Sioux Indian from up north, who was involved in the, in the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn, you know, mm-hmm. where... The Sioux and Cheyennes basically annihilated Custer. You know that story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 1876, you know. And this Sioux man, his name was uh, Standing Bear, you know. And he made a quote one time. I can't quote it exactly, but it went something like this. He said, when you lose the ways of your fathers and grandfathers, you know, when the language is gone, when the legends are gone, when the stories are gone, when the sound of the tom-tom, he used that word, when the sound of the drum is no more and it's replaced by noisy jazz, he used that term, jazz, it was kind of, he said, even though you live and breathe and walk the streets in big cities, you're no longer an Indian. Mm. Yeah. So what he's saying is, you know, you, you still have the blood, you know, you still have the color, you see, you know, but because you have lost your identity by having lost mm-hmm. every element of your culture, you're not an Indian anymore. You're just a brown skin American, you know, yeah. and I sure hate to see that happen to our people, you know. 
I've heard of a, a dance called the scalp dance. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about that? Well, that's one of our traditional dances that was associated with warfare. Mm. I mentioned earlier that history, history has recited our tribe as one of the most warlike tribes in the southern plains. And so we had a lot of, lot of dances and customs and ceremonies associated with war. Yeah. And a scalp dance was one of those, you know. And it was basically a dance performed by women, you know, and they carried what they call coup sticks, French word, C-O-U-P, coup. Mm. Yeah, you know, counting coup was a practice, what? right? Counting coup. Yeah. Yeah. Warriors, warriors, and the warrior society. They actually believed that was it was more honorable to touch an enemy right. and let him live than to kill him. Yeah. Because, I've, heard, I've heard that called counting yeah, coup. Yeah, that's yeah. what called counting coup, and the reasoning was that you kill a you kill an enemy, he don't know it, he's dead. Yeah. But when <laughs> right. you touch yeah. him, you know. <laughs> You have embarrassed and humiliated yeah. him for life yeah. because he goes back home knowing that he could have been killed. Yeah. You see? Yes. You know? And so the women then take these warrior coup sticks, decorate them with trophies that the warriors had collected from battles, yes. like scalps, you yeah. know, and they would dance with them, you know, as a means to not only celebrate the victory of their warriors, but to encourage them and to success in future battles, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's kind of like, a, always going to use an analogy of cheerleaders at the football game, you know. Yeah. They're out there trying to cheer the <laughs> team on to I'm defeat. picturing modern cheerleaders yeah. with scalps on yeah, sticks. To defeat yeah, the <laughs> other, <laughs> right. the, defeat the other team. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know? I, think, I think your version is a little bit more potent than the pom-poms. Yeah. Uh, the, the pom and we still dance that dance today. Yeah. Because the enemy has changed. Yeah. You know, whereby the enemy was our warring tribes in those days. The enemy now is drugs, alcohol. Mm. Yeah. Domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Loss of language, culture. Yeah. So it's a battle to simply defeat the forces that's trying to take that from us. You know. you know, I read a study a long time ago that was looking at violence in prisons, and what they what they realized is that the smaller a person's vocabulary was, the more likely they were inclined to violence. Yeah. And as they started teaching them more language and giving them more vocabulary to talk about what they were yeah. feeling, uh, the incidence of violence in those prisons went down. Yeah, because they had language to talk yeah. about things. Well. You know, psychologists teach us that in, in, in any interaction, you know, between human species, that communication is key. Yeah, absolutely. You know, man and wife, you know, if they don't talk, they're doomed, you mm -hmm. know. So, you know, so that, that philosophy applies all across the field. Yeah. yeah, and in talking to Jessica, she said that you all have some good programs to help tribal members who may be struggling with any of those things that you just yeah, talked about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one of the successes of our tribes. You know, we have we have programs to deal with domestic abuse, alcoholism, drug drug abuse, you know, and, uh, uh, education, you know, and so on. Yeah, yeah that's great. I, I mean, educating kids, it, yeah. It's hard to make changes with an adult generation. Yeah, yeah. Really, only by educating yeah. children can yeah. you recapture yeah. some of that stuff. Well, it's always been my belief. I told you about an old man. He said he didn't want to teach your children a language because he wanted them to, to learn the language of the dominant society mm. because that's the only way they were going to survive in the world. Yeah. Well, that's not true. Yeah, no. You know, the human species is capable, you know, of, of yeah. many, different, many different endeavors. One of my mentors says, uh, when he was asked, how many languages can a child learn? He said, as many as you will teach them. That's right, you know. And I lived in San Francisco for a while, you know. And I got the idea from Chinatown in San Francisco. Chinatown in San Francisco is one of the most famous Chinatowns in America, you mm -hmm. know. And we go down there, you know, on the weekends to eat, and, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the atmosphere. And a strange thing, but San Francisco is a very modern city, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you pass through that arch on Grant Avenue, mm -hmm. the main street in Chinatown, you know, it's basically like you leave civilized America and move into 
like Hong Kong. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's just right. like damn. It's like night. an embassy. <laughs> huh? Right. It's like their embassy in, yeah. in San Francisco. And you go into that section of town, you know, and you're in China. Yeah. And they're speaking Chinese, you know. The signs in all the stores are Chinese writing, you know. You know, the music is Chinese. The food is Chinese. All of the stores, act, it's all, you know, it's China. Yeah. But among those Chinese are doctors and lawyers. Sure. And Wall Street yeah. brokers. And when they pass out of that environment in the morning and go down on Montgomery Street in San Francisco, they become very highly educated and successful Americans. Yeah. You see? And then they go home in the evening and become Chinese. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. There is proof yeah. that you don't have to be stripped of one culture in order to survive in another. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of that, uh, tell me about Tonkawa names. How are names decided for people? And what are some examples of names? Well, you know, and in traditional times, names were given uh, that kind of reflected the, the character of the person. Mm -hmm. You know, in modern society, you know, non-Indian society, a mother or a prospective mother gets ready to have a baby and she's sitting in a hospital and her and her husband are conversing about what to name this child, you know. And they know nowadays, before it's born, whether it's a boy or a girl. Sure. So they yeah. begin to plan boy name or girl names, and yeah. they argue about whether they should name him after Uncle Joe or Aunt Maggie, yeah. you see, or so-and-so, right. -so, you know, like that. And they're not satisfied for a thing. And so they get a book out, and they look through this list, list of names, you know. Mm -hmm. And generally, in, in non-Indian society, they select a name that they like. Mm -hmm. It has no reflection on the character of the future baby. Right. Of course, they don't know the character of that future baby. Right. Born yet. <laughs> yeah. See, so when you got born, what did you say your name was John? Yep. I don't know how you got John, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, you might have been named after, you know, the apostle. You know, who, who knows? Right. You know, but is, is that John a reflection of your character? Well, you know that or not, you know. Yeah. And, and so that's how talk about people were named. And their name changed as their character changed. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. A child, a child born might be given this name, but as he matured into a mm -hmm. different character, his name changed as well. So he didn't possess the same name from start to finish. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. When I was uh, when I was little, uh, I have Cherokee ancestry, and yeah. my dad gave me the name Utstitsani, which. What? Utsitsani, yeah, which means chipmunk John. Chipmunk John. Because when I was little and I was eating, I would store oh, yeah, food yeah. in my cheeks, and yeah, my cheeks yeah, would puff yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then Agriawaya is the yeah. my adult name, yeah. uh, which is Wolf Who Goes First. Yeah. 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 But it, my name changed with my character. So. Yeah. So I give people that want Indian names today. I give them a name, and I try to. I try to think of what I perceive the character uh, of that particular person and give them a name accordingly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her name is, her name is, not, uh, is uh, not a show, you know, which means. Uh, He's pointing at Jessica off the, camera. Yeah. yeah. Moon, moonlight, you know. Oh, cool. And uh, actually means night light, you know, which is moonlight. Yeah, sure. You know, literally, you know. And so, uh, they printed her name in a tribal newsletter, you know, just to let everybody know that she got a new Indian name. And and there's, and they, and they, they wrote as Jessica's Indian name is not a show, which means moonshine. Yeah. Wait, <laughs> wait a minute. Hold it. Hold hey, it. all right. I'm going to be talking to her later after yeah. the show. <laughs> moonshine. That's right. Moonshine. Yeah, all right. Now we're talking. Right, but Let's that, break that out. That, that suggests something else. Yeah, know? right. Yeah. I do see a lot of cornfields around here. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so anyway. Yeah. So what is your Tonkawa name? Biachi thought means. Biachi thought Comes flying over. Okay. Yeah, because you were in the Air there Force, right? Huh? Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So, did got you have a different name, name as you were? Got that name before that happened. See, so it, it was kind of a prophecy. prophetic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, is there anything that you would like to add? Just about uh, the tribe, your history, uh, closing notes. No, hell, I could sit here and talk all day. You know, with that kind of <laughs> open-ended question. Yeah. You know. Maybe I should be asking Jessica. Is there anything that Jessica would like to add? Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. We got it. 
Huh. Okay. Well, um, I know that the Language Academy is something that we're really going to be pushing to, to get that organized and get that out to people. So. Yeah, we're working on it. Jet, Jet's my assistant. We're, I, I keep reminding her, we're a pretty good team, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I heard you off camera telling her I've that. Tried, yeah. I've tried to have language classes in the past, mm -hmm. in the privacy of my own home, you know? Sure. Yeah, and uh, for it, it, my biggest disappointment is that we don't have the interest that I think we ought to have, mm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, and I mean, so we've, we've got, we've got to basically build that interest. Yeah. 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 And I mean, yeah. hopefully that's where we come in is, yeah. is you know, yeah. presenting it in such a way that we're telling compelling stories yeah. and we're making it fun to people yeah. or for yeah. people to learn this. Yeah. And the nice thing I think about uh, doing things like what we're doing right now is we sit down for an hour and talk about this stuff yeah. and people can listen to this and, and pull out pieces of this story for years yeah, and yeah, years to yeah. come. And so hopefully we'll do the same thing with yeah. language yeah. and capture all of that information so that anyone can learn the Tonkawa yeah. language yeah. at any time, yeah. day or night. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. In the future, uh, anyone that wants to learn that, they'll be able to go to tonkawatribe.com and find more well, information on yeah, the Language Academy. Yeah. They've got it. They've got it pretty much technologically established where yep. we have a couple of students out in California, right? You know, yeah, that's awesome. One down in Texas, yeah. you know, you know, so. And right now your classes are usually on Thursdays at Thursday three afternoon. or four? Thursday afternoon. Three? Yeah. Okay, so 3 yeah. p.m. Central uh, yeah. Standard Time. Yeah. So if I was a person that was listening to this and I wanted to sit in on, uh, on a language class, how might I find information? Can anyone join or is it limited to? Hey. You know, it's like it's like watching TV. You know, everybody yeah. in America can watch the same show. Okay. You know, yeah. So how would they find that information, Jessica? I don't is know. That a yeah, you would have to email me at jblack at tomboytribe.com, yeah. and I would send you a link to a Zoom conference. Yeah. Okay. And the awesome. tribe, the tribe has a process by whereby they advertise this sort of thing. You know. Yeah. And I do yeah. Also advertise yeah. Okay. Yeah. So f yeah. follow Tonkawa Tribe on Facebook and, uh, yeah. you know, anywhere else. I think Instagram might be in your future. Yeah. So yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, sir, so much for sitting down with me and sharing these stories. It's been an honor yeah. to speak with you about the history of your people.